<laughs> that was a much more delightful introduction than this talk is going to be. But, uh, um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to uh, thank the organizers, uh, Dave Randall and Rong and uh, Roger, uh, for inviting me here uh, back to a place where, as David correctly said, I spent three wonderful years. And before I begin my formal presentation, I wanted to say that among the first people I interacted with when I came to UCLA was Akio Arakawa. And he had a very strong influence on, on my career. He was a wonderful man. And um, I used to uh, just spontaneously go into his office and have chats with him. He, the first thing he taught me about were uh, aerosols in the form of cigarette smoke. Oh. <laughs> and when I got used to that, I, you know, that was a very negative thing to me back then. And it is again today, but then it started to signify to me that he was in his office and it became a positive <laughs> thing for a while. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to say, though, and, and about Aki Arakawa, that uh, among the many achievements that he listed uh, that Dave Randall uh, nicely reviewed was um, his development of the quasi-equilibrium theory of convection. And people talk about his parameterization, and that was part of his paper, but the, that principle, I think it's very hard for young people to understand how revolutionary that was when it was introduced. It seems almost second nature to a lot of you, I'm sure, today, but back then it displaced another reigning paradigm which was quite different. That convection had to happen when you stored up a lot of energy over a long time and then some, some farmer lit a cigar and it would blow up and it was all about predicting the farmer, if you get my metaphor. Uh, and that was that, that paradigm works for some convection, but not most convection. And it was really revolutionary, and it certainly had a strong influence on my career. And David, you remember that you and I, and Chris Brotherton, wrote a paper about quasi-equilibrium. Okay, so I want to get into the topic now of, of the, the evening, which is the um, interesting, intellectually interesting and practically important problem of climate change and hurricanes. And it's a nice problem to talk about for scientists because it's an unsolved problem, largely. And so there are lots of interesting conversations that one might have about it. So I'm not, I'm not really going over history very much, except maybe some hurricane history. So the program is to begin globally and just look at the global record of tropical cyclones and see what we see in it. Um, talk about the Atlantic record separately. Now, why should I do that? Uh, the Atlantic gets most of the press because it borders the United States, I think. Um, but it also is, in a meteorological or climatological sense, different for ways we don't, in ways we don't understand but we have been able to quantify. It's behaving quite differently from the rest of the world in this respect. And we really don't understand why. I want to talk a little bit about hurricane physics. And using physics to go about the very important problem of estimating long-term risk from tropical cyclones. At the end of the talk, and yes, this is bait for you, uh, I'm <laughs> going to talk about hurricanes in Los Angeles. Do we have hurricanes? Well, you'll have to stick around <laughs> on that. Okay, so I'm going to begin with a global record of the number of tropical cyclones on the planet every year going back to 1980. That's about as far as we can go back. Before 1980, we didn't have global satellite coverage. Before that, we didn't have satellites at all. And many, many storms lived and died without ever uh, contacting in any <coughs> way, directly or indirectly, human beings. So they weren't recorded. So this is the best we can do. And it's not a very long record, right? It's 40 years or so. Um, and if you are a statistician or a uh, mathematician, you look at that chart and say, hmm, that's interesting. One question you might ask is, well, there are about 90 storms on average a year. Why? Why not some completely different number? 9,000, eight, right? You'd think that somebody like me, any of my colleagues who've devoted their lives to this, would be able to tell you in round numbers, this is why we, we can't <laughs> yet. And that's an amazing admission of failure. You can see that a lot of this talk is directed to young people, okay? <laughs> and we're counting on you to fix this problem. We don't know why there are 90 storms on the planet. Well, there's some arm-waving ideas and so forth. The other thing you might look at that graph and say, well, it has a standard deviation 
if you're, you're already doing, some of you have already done the calculation of about <laughs> nine. And if you know that some, nine is roughly what, well, almost exactly what you would expect if this were a random Poisson process, okay? So the, the variability that we do see there is almost certainly not driven by any climate signal we know. It's just random, okay? Now, if we break this down by basin, we can begin to see very prominent climate signals like El Nino effects, but not in this record. So, as simple as this is, it reveals a lot about we don't know. Nothing before 1980 for the globe, not quantitatively, okay? We don't know why they're 90, so remember that, okay? A lot of this talk is about what we don't know. But there are some indications of global change if you get away from just the numbers. So this is a paper from Jim Cawson about eight years ago. And it shows uh, over the span of time roughly what I just showed you, 1980 actually to 2015, um, satellite uh, derived measurements of the latitude or the distance from the equator in this case at which tropical cyclones globally were observed to reach their peak wind speed. And in both hemispheres, the northern at the top and the southern at the bottom, uh, that latitude is increasing in a statistically significant way. And we think we partially understand why that's true, but it is an interesting signal, and it's a fairly robust one. The other thing, and this is, a, this is a following basically theory that goes back 35 years, is that the ratio of the, of the number of major hurricanes, that's category three, four, and five, the relatively rare, very strong storms, to the total number of storms has been increasing. And that's what you see on this graph. Again, there's an awful lot of work that goes into creating something like this. It's, it's not straightforward at all, but there's a, sig a significant increase which goes along with some theory which I'll describe to you later. Um, the North Atlantic tropical cyclone record is interesting and is different and because of history in that region it goes back much further in time. This is, if you don't recognize it, Hurricane Ian from just a few weeks ago and uh, that was a really gruesome event but a meteorologically not so atypical in spite of what you might have heard in the radio or so not that atypical. Yes, it was certainly in the higher end of the tail of events, but it didn't really break many meteorological records. It broke some social ones. So now here is a uh, record that you can get by going online and, and going to NOAA um, of the number of hurricanes in the North Atlantic in this particular graph going back uh, just about to the turn of the last century. I'm going to tell you about what, what's wrong with that record in a minute, but this is the raw data, okay, and I put a little trend line. And you can see that, you know, if you just draw the line naively, it looks like it's going up there. But there are some interesting signals that turn out to be robust quite aside from the trend. One is which that prominent dip that begins in the 1960s and, and reaches a minimum broadly in the 1980s and then goes shooting back up. And that has got a name now. It's called the hurricane drought of the late 20th century. And we think we actually understand that. So there's a little good news. We think we've made some progress. And the explanation is absolutely fascinating. And yeah, it's man-made. But it has nothing to do with greenhouse gases. I'll come back to that. Um, this is the same kind of graph, the same data, but we're looking at the number of major hurricanes, not the total number of storms. And you can see that prominent dip again and then the very large rise at the end. Now, is that record any good? What is it based on? Well, before 1945, it was based upon uh, reports from ships, islands, um, all kinds of things. Beginning in 1945, it was also based on aircraft reconnaissance. And as I mentioned before, beginning in the 70s, we supplemented that with satellite data. But I'm showing you problems with the record going back in time by simply taking it and dividing it into two mutually exclusive but exhaustive sets. One is the number of storms that made landfall either in the Caribbean region or in the US, basically made landfall somewhere in the Atlantic region. And, the, and the, um, that's, that's the blue curves. 
The red curves are what's left over all the other storms. And they're, they're quite different. The trends are quite different. We don't have any specific reason to think that landfalling storms should have a different trend in the Atlantic. They might. But we have reasons to be suspicious that the storms that didn't make landfall early in this record just weren't observed. Okay? So that the gap you see on the left side between the blue and red curves might simply be because we really weren't observing all the cyclones that stayed out to sea back then. So this is a hint that there might be problems with the record itself. Now, uh, my colleagues um, at Princeton, Gabe Vecchi notably and Tom Knudsen, have done a very admirable job trying to see whether how much of this, uh, how much of these storms could have been missed. And what they did was quite ingenious. They took the post-1971 historical record, which we think is quite good because we had all the observing systems more or less in play. Um, and then they used digitized ship tracks from earlier in the century to sample those storms. So you pretend that those storms also existed back in the early part of the 20th century. You knew where the ships were from the shipping data set. Could the ships have observed those storms? How many of those storms would ships have missed? The, the ocean storms. And uh, they did this very scientifically. They, they ran an ensemble of a thousand realizations of possible hits and misses. And they came up with this graph, okay, which shows the historical record of the number of major hurricanes. The black line is the one I've already shown you. It's from the raw, uncorrected historical database. And the red line is the median of a thousand um, uh, simulations, if you will, <coughs> of mist storms. And as you go back in time, by the way, they only carried this forward to 1971 or something, and this has been smoothed, I should say, with a seven-year running mean. Um, you can see that as you go back for the time, it's likely you miss storms. But it's, uh, if you look at the 20th and 80th quantile among those 1,000 simulations, observing system simulations, if you will, um, they never let the number of storms in these simulations go below the historical record, which is why there's no pink shading below the black line. But there's still a 20% chance the historical record might have been pretty good, okay? And another 20% chance that it's, uh, it's, it's there are many more missed than they would have estimated in the median. So it's a dicey exercise, this, but you can see a lot of effort has gone into it. There are potential problems with this. <clears throat> they, did, um, they added back in the missing storms additively, whereas they should have done it multiplicatively. And so you can, you can see that's true because if you had a year that had no storms, by this method you would have, that actually had no storms, you would have corrected that to a year with a, uh, a non-zero number of storms. And they only used digitized ship records. This is a, this is a lesson again some, somewhat more negative one for young people. If you want to go, go online and get things, that's a wonderful resource. But it won't get you everything in some cases. And there are a lot of records that the, the uh, old-fashioned guys with the green eye shades back in the 60s and 70s got off of newspaper reports and other things that they used to construct this historical record that never got digitized, ships records that never got digitized. So, um, so, there is, so there's a reason to also, another reason to be a little suspicious of the corrections. Now I'd like to, to by way of introducing you to the physics of storms, but also using physics to understand some of the records I just showed you, I want to talk to you a little bit about physics. That's the track of Hurricane Ian, and that's a satellite video you see at the left that um, shows that this storm had a a large amount of lightning in it, which is unusual. So I've drawn you this cartoon by way of showing you the energy cycle for a hurricane, which compared to most other atmospheric phenomena is actually remarkably simple at heart. Of course, there are lots of bells and whistles that one can add on to it. But if you imagine a hurricane that's circularly symmetric and exists in a steady state, and uh, you go through a cycle uh, starting at A, um, and riding a, a virtual hot air balloon in toward the center of the storm. You have inflow in the boundary layer. Of course, it's spiraling around the center of the storm very rapidly. 
Uh, as it moves in, it goes, of course, to the lower pressure of the center of the storm. Uh, but it doesn't cool adiabatically. It's not observed to because it's in contact with the ocean. And there are lots and lots of turbulent fluxes of, of sensible and latent heat from the sea. And so that expansion is more nearly isothermal. And as you know, that means you've added heat to the air. At the same time, you're evaporating a great deal of water into the air, and that's the boiler room of this heat engine of the hurricane. It's a transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere when water evaporates. And for the non-scientists in the room, this is exactly what happens when you, why you feel cold when you're wet. The water is evaporating from your skin, taking heat from your body. That's energy. It doesn't disappear. It gets added to the air. Uh, then the air turns up, it goes up the eye wall of the hurricane. It's a very nearly moist adiabatic ascent, and uh, it's a moist adiabatic decompression to low pressure or expansion. And then in the real world, it's not a closed cycle, but in models we can force it to be closed. It doesn't seem to change things very much. You have another uh, region in the lower stratosphere of an isothermal loss and then a moist adiabatic compression. Now, those of you who have had thermodynamics 101 or more advanced will recognize this as the four legs of the ideal Carnot heat engine cycle, which is the most efficient way to convert heat energy into mechanical energy uh, in a system that's run between fixed temperatures. And it's remarkable that a hurricane is very close to this ideal Carnot cycle if it's running at, if it's actually running in an ideal way which few of them do, but some of them actually, actually do. Um, and this is why, essentially, that you can take the most benign climate on the Earth, the tropics, it's, why, it's where you see uh, pretty pictures in the travel agency beckoning you to a very calm and nice place. But the same nice place, the tropics, breeds these really violent storms. And it's, uh, it's this very efficient uh, cycle that allows them to be so violent. Now, from that cycle, quantitatively, we can put an upper bound on the hurricane wind speed in its steady state. And here's a map of the annual maximum of that bound in the current climate, more or less, in meters per second. Uh, it's a thermodynamic argument, so it doesn't know that hurricanes are impossible on the equator, for example. Uh, that engine won't work. It works elsewhere, though, and uh, the bound is perfectly reasonable in terms of historical records of these storms. But that bound is changing, and uh, it's easy to calculate it from climate data. It's not something you need hurricane data to calculate. You just need to know the temperature of the ocean and the atmosphere to a good approximation. And this is the uh, trend in meters per second per century uh, from something called reanalysis data. It's basically analysis of the climate system going back, in this case, to 1979. And I, I'm only showing you those trends where they're significant at the, uh, at the um, I think it's the 1%, no, 5%, 5% level. And you can see that they're mostly upward, okay? Those trends are going upward, and we predicted 30 years ago that they would go up. And the reason is the physics is very, is very simple. When you put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you have to increase the potential rate of evaporation of seawater to balance the in extra infrared radiation going into the sea. In other words, for the ocean temperature to remain constant, it has to lose more heat energy by evaporation to compensate for the extra infrared radiation it's getting from the atmosphere due to the greenhouse effect. So it's very straightforward physics. It's not uniform. And um, in the Pacific particularly, it's, it's largest in the subtropics, not, not near the equator so much. And we understand why that is as well, but that's more advanced physics. I won't talk about them right now. So what does that mean about real hurricanes? All we're saying is we're raising the speed limit. You know if you go down to the... Um, uh, 405 freeway and, and replace all the speed limit signs, it won't take very long for the traffic to be going faster. But we don't know whether that's true of hurricanes. Um, so, armed with that and some other advances in physics, um, I want to now turn to something which is um, of interest to me recently and is becoming very interesting 
across uh, a large swath of society, which is the idea of using physics to estimate her long-term hurricane risk. I'm not talking about forecasting individual storms. You all know we do that. That's, a, that's an exercise where numerical modeling, Akio Arakawa's forte, is so important. But it hasn't been used to estimate long-term risk. Questions like, how vulnerable are we to hurricanes in Los Angeles? Okay. The problem is that today, all the risk estimates, including the risk estimates that might be behind your property insurance policy, are based purely on historical statistics of hurricanes. That's it. Okay? There's no other consideration in that problem. Now, why is that a problem? I've already sort of shown you, with the, even with respect to the Atlantic record, the record isn't very long. There are not enough statistics. We'll see it toward the end of the talk that in a place like Los Angeles, there are almost none at all, right? There are not enough statistics to do a good job with that. A. B. It turns out the statistics, even if you had statistics, really robust statistics for the last 100 years, are not a very good guide to the risk today, let alone the future, because the climate's changing. And my big message to you is that in most places, the climate has already changed enough that historically based risk estimates for the tail risks, which is what insurance companies and others are really worried about, are just plain wrong. Okay? And that's dangerous. It means as a society, we're misestimating. In some places, we're overestimating, by the way. It's not uniformly bad. We're misestimating risk. And this group of people, the group that were at the conference today, my profession, are in a position to do something about that. Okay? I'm going to talk about how we've approached it for hurricanes, but it be, could be approached this way for a large, not this particular way, but this concept of bringing physics to bear on risk could be applied across a, long a, a very broad range of weather risks. So the way we do it for hurricanes is that if the problem with using a climate model directly is today, they don't quite have enough resolution to really resolve hurricanes. So I think they will soon and be able to run for hundreds or thousands of years. Now, that's coming, I suppose, but it's not here yet. So we can't use the climate models directly, but we can use the climate models to provide the large scale environments in which storms form and live their lives. So what we do MIT is we take the output from either a climate analysis or a large-scale model and we embed within it a high-resolution, very fast, uh, coupled ocean atmosphere model. You actually have to couple it to the ocean to allow the ocean to respond to the storm. And we embed that in either the output of a global climate model or reanalysis data. And we, We've been using this model not for this purpose but for actual forecasts of real storms for 20 years or so. And then what we do, uh, the way we apply this in practice is we start with the global climate from a climate model or climate analysis. We seed the uh, state of that model with a very large number of seeds randomly located in space and time. They're assumed to move with the large scale flow which the, the model of the reanalysis provides suitably weighted in the vertical, uh, very interesting story behind each of these steps, by the way, uh, a correction for the fact that the Earth is uh, spherical and rotating, so-called beta drift. Um, and then we run, once we have these tracks, we run the intensity model along each of them, and it, it actually, in practice, well over 99% of those seeds just die right away. And so it's, it's the remainder that we, uh, that we want to do that we uh, actually focus on here. Um, so it's kind of a natural selection technique. It's borrowed from the idea of natural selection. It's not, in this case, survival of the fittest, because all the seeds are pretty much the same. It's seeds surviving because they were put in the right environment. All right. That 1% survival rate, similar to my actual experience as an amateur gardener at home, by the way. OK. Um, so here is an example of a mere 1,000 storms. We can easily generate 100,000 uh, by this technique downscaled from a climate analysis. 
um, over the 20th century. For those of you who've seen maps of that, for those of you who haven't, these, this is a map of real storms from satellite data and other data sources, 1979 to 2015. You can see differences. For example, the synthetic tracks lo last longer. That's not a real effect so much. That's because in both the real case and the synthetic case, we have to make somewhat arbitrary decisions about when we declare the storm dead or no longer tropical. And what happens to the real storms is that when they are sufficiently non-tropical, they get handed off to a different agency and not recorded in this database. And we don't do that. We just say when the wind drops below some wind speed, it's finished. So there are all these arbitrary things that go into deciding. It's also true for deciding when a storm is formed, by the way. But and the nice thing is that we capture the full distribution of probability distribution of intensity. Um, so this is what you're seeing here. It's just a histogram of the number of storms uh, exceeding wind speed you see on the bottom axis. The blue is from actual observations. This happens to be for the Atlantic. And the red is from the synthetic tracks. And the green is just a, green bars are just an estimate of the sampling error of the historical tracks. And we get the annual cycle. The blue dots are from historical data. The red curve is from the synthetic tracks. And the blue shading is, uh, again, an estimate of sampling error from the historical tracks. I don't want to go on ad nauseum. We, the Atlantic storms are very sensitive to whether you have an El Nino or La Nina going. And this just shows you the number of storms in, in three phases of ENSO and two phases of a different kind of oscillation called the Atlantic Mudiano mode. And the blue is from observations. The red is, is predicted. So um, OK, now that we have this technique and we have some reason to have some confidence in it, what happens when we apply it? So we're going to go back now to this historical record, which I told you was so problematic. And we're going to try to attack this by saying, well, yes, we don't have very good records of hurricanes going back, say, to 1900. But we do have pretty good records now of the very largest scale global climate. For example, we had sea surface temperatures going back that far from ships, uh, mostly. And then there's this, this uh, climate reanalysis, which tries to take those observations and add a physical model, if you will, to them, and uh, fill in the gaps. And then we can downscale that physical model. That, for those of the, you in the know about, that these are the so-called 20th century reanalysis analyses we're going to downscale. Before we do that, um, this is just a result of applying this technique to nine uh, of the latest generation of global climate models, CMIP-6 models, for the end of the 20th century and for the rest of this century under, a, under the proposition uh, of CO2 growing by 1% per year, which is somewhat faster than it is growing, by the way, but just as an exercise. The shading is the scatter, uh, a measure of the scatter among the nine climate models. And you can see um, a little bit of upward trend in the 20th century. This is globally, by the way, and, uh, but then a more significant upward trend. But this is not the total frequency of storms. It's the frequency of category five storms. You could never get this from historical data. They're far too rare. Okay, doesn't mean this is right. <clears throat> but if we continue to advance the application of physics to this problem, I'm fairly confident we can do better. Um, and we can get down very local with this. This technique also produces rainfall from hurricanes. And rainfall is the big killer, by the way. Yeah, the guy on the Weather Channel stands out and tries to hold himself upright in a terrible windstorm. For Everybody thinks of a hurricane as a windstorm. And nobody wants to stand out in the rain. Rain's boring. Rain's the killer. Far and away, globally, rain from these storms kills many, many, many more people than the wind does. Okay, so we're concerned about rain. What I'm showing you here is the rainfall in each county in the U.S., uh, which represents a, an event whose likelihood is uh, one in 100 years or, or larger probability. So, um, if you look at the color scale, you can see 
that South Florida, the Gulf Coast, can have 100-year rain events from tropical cyclones of maybe uh, three or 400 millimeters, 40 centimeters, uh, 15 inches, something like that. Now I'm going to apply the same thing to the end of the century under a um, emission scenario called 37.0. It's sort of a, a business as usual CO2 emission scenario. Same color scale, okay, and, and look what's happening up and down the East Coast in Florida and the Gulf Coast. So that's rainfall from a 100-year storm in the last 20 years or so, uh, 30 years. And this, <coughs> and this is at the end, same, uh, same color scale at the end of the century. This has us worried, okay? This really has us worried. And there's been enough change from 1975 to 2022 that the insurance companies, the FEMA emergency planners are all basing their estimates of rainfall on data like this, essentially, data consistent with this. When it's part of the way toward that. And that's what has us worried, okay? So now let's get back to the scientific question of can we use this to help explain what actually happened in the Atlantic? And we're going to downscale three of these climate analyses, some of which went back to the middle of the 19th century, actually. We're going to run 100 synthetic tropical cyclones uh, for each year in that record, retain only those that reached a reasonable magnitude, we're going to do this first for the North Atlantic and then for the rest of the world, or for all of the world. And it's quite remarkable what you see. So I've already shown you a version of this graph. This is the number of major hurricanes in the North Atlantic going back to 1900. The blue is um, from the historical hurricane data. The red is what you get from applying this downscaling technique to one of these three reanalysis, climate reanalyses. So the red curve and the blue curve are totally independent in the way they came about. There's, nothing, there's no aspect of that blue curve that enters the calculation of that red. And they're pretty similar. The red shading shows just the expected sampling error of the, of the historical tracks, which is very large because there's so few major hurricanes. And yet the two curves are, are not too badly aligned and there is an upward trend. If we put that same curve down, the blue curve from the, from the downscaling on this map that tries to correct that record, you can see that it actually aligns better with the historical record than the historical record corrected with uh, missing data. Um, if we confine ourselves to just storms that make landfall in the continental United States, the blue curve uh, is from historical data. The red curve is from um, downscaling. This is all tropical stor storms. It turns out that all the red curve has an upward slope. It's not statistically significant. And the blue curve obviously is just about flat. So this is, a, this is one of these cherry picked statistics that lots of people like to use. Well, there hasn't been any change in hurricanes hitting the US. Okay, well, it's true, right? But it's, a, it's, uh, it's, it's missing a broader picture. So if instead of confining ourselves to the US, we look at all landfalling storms, no matter where they made landfall, that is, we don't, we're, we don't remain US-centric, uh, then we get this uh, record. So this is the number of storms uh, hitting land anywhere, basically, reasonably big land. Um, the blue is historical, the red is from the synthetic technique. And uh, you can see that the two agree pretty well and that there is an upward trend. So the fact that we haven't had a trend in the continental U.S. is likely just a statistical fluke. There's no physical reason why we shouldn't see that trend. Um, okay, and now if we use one of the other reanalyses to go back further in time, now we're going all the way back to, uh, what is it, 1850 or so, then we begin to see differences. Um, in the 19th century, there obviously were, well, if you believe this, there almost certainly were some missed storms in the 19th century. Um, all right, so I want to turn to the more scientifically interesting question. Why did we have a hurricane drought in the 1980s and 90s, 70s and 80s? Okay, 
This uh, is really robust statistically. It wasn't just a figment of our imagination. It happened. It was very consequential. There was huge development, economic development of the U.S. coastline during that time. And in hindsight, they were setting themselves up for a big fall. And we've unfortunately been witness to what happens uh, when you have a big fall like that. So it turns out that through this historical record, the North Atlantic tropical cyclone frequency is strongly correlated with the speed limit I talked about earlier, potential intensity. And uh, my graduate student developed a technique for partitioning changes of that into a part owing to global climate change and to regional effects. Now, it turns out that um, you can have much stronger effects on the speed limit by changing the ocean temperature regionally than by changing it globally. If you want to know why, come talk to me uh, afterwards or tomorrow. Anyway, he did this quite quantitatively, applied this to the North Atlantic Genesis region. And um, this is what that partition shows. So again, the blue is the number of tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic going back this time. And then the potential intensity curve is black. So you can see the two are correlated. And then the dashed lines represent the breakdown of that into the global contribution, which is the green line and the regional contribution. You can see the green line is sloping upward. That's the effect of greenhouse gases on this. That's what we expected. But most of the change had nothing to do with that green curve. It was strictly regional change. So something funny is happening in the Atlantic. What? So why did that happen? Well, this may surprise you. It was all the fault of Europe, OK? I know, I'm, I'm looking at my European friends. No, it's not the fault of Europe. It's, it turns out that uh, it is uh, the fault of um, uh, particulate emissions of sulfur that's a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. And those emissions soared. This is a record of uh, emissions. I'm showing you the European emissions for a reason. The North American look qualitatively similar to that. They rocketed upward from after World War II, reaching a peak in around 1980. And then they fell just as quickly. They fell because of the Clean Air Acts. Right? The reason I'm showing you the European component of that is that the European sulfates in the summertime circulation are carried down uh, on the east side of the big Azores High, over the Mediterranean and over the Sahara Desert and south of that, and they actually reflect sunlight and um, suppress something called the African monsoon, which is responsible for a lot of the rain that falls in the Sahel in the summertime. And demonstrably, there was a huge drought during this period. And many decades ago, this drought was actually linked to sulfur emissions from Europe. Okay. What that did is it led to much more lofting of dust from the deserts of Africa into the air, something that happens naturally every year, but happened in spades during this time. That dust is carried uh, westward by the trade winds over the Atlantic, and it reflects sunlight. So a combination of the African mineral dust and the sulfates led to a profound cooling of the tropical Atlantic, in summer at least, during this whole period. That's also very clear in the records. Um, and so this is a breakdown uh, that Raphael, the, the student, did uh, that show uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an EOF-like breakdown. It isn't quite that. The global pattern of, of change in potential intensity that your sea surface temperature that you get over this uh, period, showing that the, this period that contained the hurricane drought. Um, and the, on the bottom left, the other mode, which uh, is almost certainly due to this dust from, mineral dust from Africa. And the time series of those two modes are shown at the right. And you can see a gentle upward trend, particularly at the end of the record from the global component, but a spectacular dip in the late 20th century from the regional component. So, we sort of explained the hurricane drought, but we haven't really explained the longer term upward trend. And we don't really know why that's true. What I'm going to show you next, and it'll be almost the last thing I show you tonight, 
is that that's not true of the globe as a whole. Uh, consistent with the historical record, we don't really see in the downscale hurricanes any trend globally. So there's something special about the Atlantic, and I'm, show, I'm throwing out a speculation here, and it's sheer speculation that it may have something to do with changes in the strength of the o overturning circulation of the ocean, which particularly affects the Atlantic sector. But, it, but the big message is we don't know why there is a trend. So this is applying exactly the same downscaling, but applying it to the global tropics and not just the Atlantic. By the way, only about 10% of the world's tropical cyclones occur in the Atlantic, even though they get 99% of the press. So the top shows um, uh, the downscaling of these three different reanalyses. The historical record only goes back to 1980 in most of the rest of the world. Uh, but the bottom line is no significant trends when we do that. If we look at the number of major hurricanes, there are small significant upward trends reflecting an increase that we've already seen in the observations of intensity, but not frequency globally. Okay, the final subject. This is where you're supposed to wake up. <laughs> I should bring an alarm at this point. Um, are there tropical cyclones in Los Angeles? And Yes, there have been, and I want to thank Steve Kruger for uh, putting me on to uh, some sort of very interesting sources of historical data, mostly the Los Angeles Times, but they've done a very thorough job of this. So yes, there have been. Um, let's look at more broadly at the southwestern U.S. These are storms that originate in the tropical eastern North Pacific, not the Atlantic. Uh, only four storms in the record, going back to 1900 or so, have brought tropical storm force winds to any point in the southwest U.S. Um, only a single of the, only one of these events made direct landfall in Southern California. The rest came over land uh, from Baja and so forth. Um, no storms have yet made landfall in the U.S. as hurricanes, as tropical cyclones with winds over 64 knots, with sustained winds over 64 knots. But uh, many of the many, well, those tropical cyclones and many remnants of tropical cyclones have strongly affected the U.S., uh, southwest U.S., mostly by creating torrential rains. And once again, that's the problem. Especially here in L.A., it's not going to be wind. You're not going to have much problem with wind ever, probably. It's, it's the water that's the problem. Now, the strongest one to affect Los Angeles that we know about um, was the cyclone of September 24th, 26, 1939. They did have wind gusts, gusts to 65 knots and five and a half inches of rain in downtown Los Angeles. Mount Wilson had 11 and a half inches, um, or, uh, 100, order 100 lives lost uh, at sea and from flooding which is about the same as the death toll from Ian, by the way. And this is an interesting meteorological fact. The cyclone created strong easterly winds ahead of it, which are downslope here in Los Angeles, and created a phenomenal heat wave in the days leading up to the hurricane. So when the outer bands of the hurricane showed up, they were quite uh, widely celebrated here. Uh, they weren't quite sure what they were in for at that time. So here's a reconstructed path of that tropical uh, storm in 1939. There was an earlier one that year that is the little, the little uh, thin line that goes up into Arizona. And here is the cover of the front page of the LA Times on the 25th of September. And some photographs of the, the damage that the storm caused, which was actually quite extensive, the storm. So yes, we sometimes do get tropical cyclones. Now, if if you were running an insurance company here in Southern California, um, this would be a big headache for you because you'd want to know, uh, you know, what should I charge for hurricane-related insurance? And you're going to base that on one storm? You wouldn't feel very comfortable doing that. And this is where I think our community can help them by augmenting history, if you will, with physics. So when we do this technique, the same technique I've been talking about, we applied it to Los Angeles. So specifically, 
filtered these events to only include ones passing within 150 kilometers of downtown Los Angeles and having to have winds within that 150 kilometer radius of 30 knots or more. So there are 1,260 events downscaled from a climate analysis or reanalysis and then also 1,200 events downscaled from each of nine CMIP six generation models for each of two periods, the 20th century, 1971 to 2010, and then this uh, fairly liberal emission scenario at the last 40 years of this century. So this is the strongest of the top 100 of the 1,260 events downscaled from ERA five reanalyses. I thought I had put on that. This is 1979 to to uh, 2020, and not surprisingly, most of the storms that affect us, the strong ones, these are the strong ones, come in from the southwest, so they remain over water. They're all decaying by the time they get here, but some of them manage to hold on to their strength a little bit. And um, this just shows you a histogram of the expected frequency of storms in that climate here in Los Angeles. This is, again, wind speeds within 150 kilometers of here. So they could be way out to sea, not necessarily here over land. The tropical storms, you know, maybe once every 11 or 12 years, you should have a storm passing within 150 kilometers. And then maybe once every 50 years, something of category one hurricane strength. And by the time you get to two, it's essentially never, okay, in the current climate. It just won't happen here. Physics don't support it. Now, if we go forward in time, we do see uh, changing risk, but that change is very uncertain, as all predictions of the future are. So the blue curve is running the climate models in the 20th century, where they don't all agree, uh, of course, because they're climate models, um, but at least they start from a more or less the same point. And that shows, this is the, this is the um, return period uh, of storms whose wind speed exceeds the value you see on the bottom axis. So the probability of getting a storm again within 150 kilometers of here with at least 64 knots, according to the climate models, is about once in 70 years and may double in frequency roughly to once every 37 years. But the shading shows the scatter among the nine climate models. And if you look at that, you can see there's enormous uncertainty going forward, okay? And this is just what we have to live with until we have better climate models. Um, this is the same thing, but it's for rain rather than wind. So it's return period of storm total rainfall in millimeters exceeding the value on the x-axis. And that more or less triples. And that's what worries me if I were here. It would worry me if I were a homeowner or the business of insuring homes or commercial buildings or whatever. It's, it's that that you worry about. And notice that even with the uncertainty, there's a more separation between those two curves, okay? This is the kind of data that we can produce and we have to be completely straightforward about the uncertainties. And this is only part of the uncertainty. There's uncertainty in the downscaling, there's uncertainty in the historical records which are used to calibrate this and so forth. Uh, but the rain worries me. Now, if you go just a short distance, this is for specifically downtown, a point in downtown Los Angeles. This is not the maximum rainfall in 150 kilometers. It's for a point. If we move that point to Mount Wilson, uh, not surprisingly, you get a lot more rain up there, okay? So I looked at the change in return period of 600 millimeters of, rain, of storm total rain, all right? What's interesting are these events that you get with you know, very, very long return periods that are two meters of rain. Now, what would two meters of rain do to the mountains of Southern California? This is probably not something we ought to worry about because it's too infrequent, but if I were a geologist, I'd be thinking, you know, what kind of events do we need to think about when we think about long-term erosion? Um, this is the uh, contours of the maximum wind experienced at every point during a single event um, that occurred in the year 2100 in one of these climate models whose center followed that black line. I think you can see where you are. You notice how quickly the winds decay inland, particularly around here, but you've got order 80 knots. This is a, a very rare storm even by the end of the century. 
And this is a completely different storm showing the storm total rainfall at various points. And you can really, really see the influence of orography on this, right? especially around here. It's the, it's the high terrain where you get these really spectacular amounts. Now, this, again, is a rare event. You're never going to see this in the historical record unless you're a geologist and know how to detect floods in historical records, maybe. All right, let me summarize. Um, historical observations and physics, I would say, or at least as, as we have implemented those physics, show pretty substantial upward trends in North Atlantic storms interrupted by a prominent, and I think we can argue man-made, hurricane drought in the 70s and 80s. Uh, previous work might have overestimated the number of missing storms because they didn't account for all the records that actually went into the uh, history of hurricanes. The drought was probably caused by, directly by, mostly by Saharan mineral dust anomalies associated with the drought caused by European sulfate aerosol forcing. Um, no detectable frequency trend in global tropical cyclones, either in the observations or downscaled. And this is, this is bait for the oceanographers, but serious bait. Is there something going on here that's interesting? Why should the Atlantic be behaving so differently in terms of its tropical cyclones? Is it, is it changes in the overturning circulation? I don't know. I don't know of anybody who thinks they know. But um, it might be interesting to look into this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, questions? We just have that one, and it's the. This one's working. So uh, yeah, if you take that, right. Nice talk. Uh, in the last few blocks, you were discussing the uncertainty around the uh, PC projection over LA. And then said the uncertainty was a symmetric in distribution. Is there a particular reason for that? Yeah, um, there is. Um, so what we assume is symmetric is the frequency. In other words, we assume that the error in the frequency is Gaussian. Might not be the greatest assumption, that's what we assume. When you turn that into a return period, which is the inverse of the frequency, that's where the asymmetry shows up. That's all, yeah. Sure, yeah. Thank you. The first point is the, yeah, the sub-hurricane load. Yeah, the reason is the why European sub aerosol is cooling after the Sahara. Yeah, so um, what seems to have happened is we, we know that the effect of sulfate aerosols, which are a result of the sulfur emissions, is a negative effect, generally speaking, on temperature. But it's highly regional because the sulfate's uh, residence time in the atmosphere, the, sulf the sulfate aerosol residence time is about two weeks. And after two weeks, in all likelihood, they've been rained out. So the sulfate effects are not global. They're regional, concentrated near their sources, which in that era were mostly North America, the industrialized countries, so North America, Japan, uh, Europe, so forth. Um, in the case of Europe, those aerosols were transported down over the um, North Atlantic. We know that from uh, records of dust deposition in northern Africa that show the clear signature of the aerosols uh, from Europe. And, um, and this is not our own work, by the way. It goes back decades or so. That is widely um, looked at as the source of the rather profound drought in Africa and the Sahelian region of that period because you were cooling down the Sahara and reducing the magnitude of the summer monsoon in that part of Africa. 
then the next link in that chain is you were, and this is also demonstrably true, you were lifting a lot more mineral dust in the atmosphere back then. The dust records offshore and cores on the Cape Verde Islands and so forth very, show a dramatic increase going along with the decrease in rainfall in the Sahel. And the temperature of the tropical Atlantic decreased. Now, why we can ascribe that with some confidence is that we've done single column modeling, where all we've done is taken a, you know, an art, a radiative convective single column model and dump the observed amount of aerosol into it, and we got pretty much the observed cooling. D dust plus sulfate, by the way. So that's it's it's a it's a causal link. It's a really a real detective story, actually, <laughs> to come up with this, but it. It seems to work pretty well, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, for a super interesting talk. I was wondering for the two last bullet points that you have up on the slide there, I mean, you know, if you have an upward trend in the Atlantic, you have a downward trend elsewhere. And, and yeah. in the last bullet point, you speculate, you know, on, on a reason why there might be an upward trend, and you know, there might be reasons why there are downward trends elsewhere. Do you think there's a connection between know, some reason why there would be a dust. So I'm asking, is there a reason why the uh, global frequency is constant, or do you think that's a coincidence, essentially? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It's actually the first question I posed in the talk, why we have 90 storms a year that's relatively constant. I, in, in response to the first part of your question, because Atlantic storms are about 10% of the total, if the total really were constant, I'm not sure the downward trend that must be there, as if, if the whole the total really is constant, would be detectable against the noise. It's just that the Atlantic is a small but important, has, has this important trend, yeah. So when we, I left out a part of the paper uh, for time reasons that I, that these results came from. Just came out a few weeks ago, by the way. I certainly have to send you a link to it. That part that I left out dealt with higher order modes. Remember I showed you a global mode and a regional mode. There is also a mode that looks very much like what people have called an Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. The problem with that mode is it's not multi-decadal, it's more like decadal. It's like a 10-year, it's not a 50-year thing, it's a 10-year thing. But it, it's present throughout the period. It's not modulated the way this global and regional mode are in time. And um, its spatial EOF looks like the EOF that has been ascribed in, ascribed in climate models that are run without changes in forcing. So they're really free oscillations of the climate model. It looks like the EOFs of the climate model in what people have called this AMO thing. So the, I guess the bottom line is that the AMO is also there in our data, but it's closer to 10 years. And why it's different from what climate models do, I don't know. But the climate models actually are not very robust on the period of this oscillation. They are robust on the, on the pattern of the EOF, but not the period, and I have no idea why they're not, but, yeah. And Warren, I think this would probably be our last question. Uh, so, Kara, you're getting return periods for the uh, tropical cyclones that were in Southern California. If you can do that, can't you predict how many there would be per year for a nice uh, Yeah, so, um, Steve, I'm not sure that question was heard. I think the microphone's battery is dying, but Steve asked if you can do this for a long period, can you say um, how many storms there'll be each particular year? And the answer is no, 
or you could only you can only talk about probabilities with this method. Um, if there were a really strong climate signal, well, to take a trivial example, we can predict that they're not going to happen in January. Okay, <laughs> yes, we can do that. But aside from that, the interannual variability, if there were a big natural climate signal, I suspect, we haven't looked for it, that there's an ENSO signal there. So we could give you an ENSO specific probability, right? Presumably would be higher in, an, in Southern California in an El Nino year. So uh, we could try that. <laughs>